Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Friends, listeners, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury censorship, not to praise it. Theater. It's been on my mind here recently. And not only because I just went and saw The Phantom of the Opera on Broadway, finally, but also because the theater has been inserted into my world of free speech advocacy. As many of you probably already know by now, last month a performance of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar in New York Central Park was briefly interrupted when an audience member stormed the stage. Like many critics of the play, the heckler objected to the depiction of Julius Caesar as a costumed Donald Trump. They wanted the play shut down, The problem, of course, being that, spoiler alert, Julius Caesar gets assassinated. Following the outrage, a few companies pulled their sponsorship of the production. There were calls for its remaining performances to be canceled. And Donald Trump Jr., in true Trumpian fashion, took to Twitter to suggest that if the play uses taxpayer money, it could face consequences. We've dealt with outrage on this show before. We've dealt with attempted and successful heckler's vetoes before, but we haven't yet addressed either of these topics as they relate to theater and the arts. So I thought this was as good a time as any to explore the topic. Hello again, I'm your host, Nico Perino, and on today's episode of So to Speak, the free speech podcast, we are joined by Howard Sherman. Howard's the director of the Arts Integrity Initiative at the New School in New York City, which was formed in 2015 to, quote, follow, research, record, and play an active advocacy role in the many incidents which threaten opportunities for the arts to be the best that they can be at the educational, community, and professional levels, close quote. I pulled that quote from the Arts Integrity Initiative's website. Howard, like the Arts Integrity Initiative, is fiercely anti-censorship. He was named one of the top 40 free speech defenders of 2014 by the National Coalition Against Censorship, and he received the Dramatist Legal Defense Fund 2015 Defender Award for his work on artist rights and theatrical censorship. He's also a great Twitter follow because he knows all the latest happenings in the theater world. Howard was actually in the audience on Friday, June 16th, when the protester stormed the stage at the Delacorte Theater in Central Park. And using Twitter, he might have been the first to break the story to the world outside the theater. I too saw the production when it was in previews in May, long before there was any controversy surrounding it. The play had actually been in production for weeks before there was any controversy, which is kind of part of the reason that I was surprised when the controversy finally did arrive. During this conversation at the new school in New York City with Howard, he and I discussed the public theater's production of Julius Caesar before we explore other cases of attempted theater censorship that he's fought against during his career. We also discussed the role of the arts and how art censorship has changed over the years. Now I bring you Howard Sherman. Howard, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So when I was coming up with a podcast for this week and thinking about new topics in the world of of freedom of expression, I I recalled the Julius Caesar production put on by the New York Public Theater, the Public Theater. Uh, They do shows every summer uh, featuring Shakespeare works. Uh, is it was it always Shakespeare? It's predominantly Shakespeare. They've done they've done some shows that aren't Shakespeare. They've done Brecht, the the musical Hair, things like that. Yeah, so. it's Shakespeare in the Park, though, is what they Correct. typically call it, and it's a it's a free show put on by the public theater f- for New Yorkers. And in May, I had actually gone and seen the production of Julius Caesar, and the production takes uh, actors who are placed in a contemporary setting and retells the story of Julius Caesar. And uh, I, you, you're probably more familiar with Shakespeare's work and the stories than I am. Do you want to describe for our listeners what the story is? Oh, gosh. The story of Julius Caesar is really the story of 
the Roman senators who conspire to assassinate him because the death of Caesar comes halfway through the show. So it's not really Caesar's story. In many ways, it's primarily the story of Brutus, one of the the key conspirators. Um, and what the public did, as is so often done with Shakespeare nowadays, is it reset it into a different place and time. In this case, it was set in the present day. Um, you had people who were protesters. The, the Roman mob was, was, were people who might have been Occupy Wall Street or the demonstrations that have ensued uh, since President Trump was elected. And indeed, the production costumed uh, the character of Caesar a la Donald Trump and costumed Calpurnia Caesar's wife a la Melania Trump. And that's the seed of of why the production became so well known. But and controversial, but this isn't unique for productions of Julius Caesar. What I'm told, it, it's certainly not unique to reset Julius Caesar in in plenty of different eras and plenty of different times. And I'm told that there have been Julius Caesars that have portrayed many presidents during their eras. The Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis uh, a few years back did a production which was perhaps not quite so overtly patterned on a uh, President Obama, but there there were definitely parallels, and some of the critics saw that and noted that in their reviews. So it's not novel. This was certainly the first major production uh, that people became aware of that that modeled the characters on on the Trumps. Yeah, and the controversy, of course, arises because if you're modeling one of the characters on the president, especially if that character is Julius Caesar, the Julius Caesar character gets assassinated midway through the play. Uh, so th- in this case, there was many on the conservative right who saw this as um, untort of sorts. Uh, well, I think I think what we need to be clear about, you know, you mentioned that you saw the show in previews. The show ran for four weeks. The majority of those performances were previews. They only opened the show to the press, uh, certainly the theatrical press, about a week before it closes. And what happened was running up to that weekend, it was perhaps Thursday or Friday, um, someone had seen it who either was affiliated with or contacted Fox News, who began running a story about a play that depicted the assassination of Donald Trump. And in fact, in the early versions of the story, the fact that the play was Julius Caesar was subordinate to that headline. That certainly stirred up a great deal of consternation over the idea that any play would would portray the uh, the assassination of a president, even though the play was portraying the assassination of Julius Caesar, costumed to look like the president. But it was no only one line of dialogue in the whole show reportedly was was altered. Um, and over the course of the weekend, certainly social media and other other outlets sort of spun that up very quickly, resulting in two sponsors of the production, underwriters of the free Shakespeare in the Park, which has existed since the 1950s, um, withdrawing their support. One withdrawing their support entirely from the public theater, the other simply withdrawing their support from that production. Yeah, this was Delta and then Bank of America. Correct. Or Bank of America and then Delta withdrew their... their I don't place. remember the, remember the, the order, but... Yeah. Um, so so that sort of built everything up over the weekend. The show opened officially on a Monday night. This is in June. Uh, in June. And uh, the reviews came out. Certainly that press brought more attention, more awareness, and it was difficult for those reviews not to acknowledge the, the, the maelstrom of public opinion that had arisen over the weekend. 
And then um, on Friday of that week, and mind you, this is now in the last three days of the run, uh, when I happened to be seeing the show, uh, someone did in fact run on stage and and say that this was, I'm not going to remember the phrase exactly now. But yeah, I have the quote here. It says, uh, the person who ro- ran up on stage, uh, was a woman, said, stop the normalization right. of political violence against the right. This is violence against Donald Trump. And I'm just going to read the first few paragraphs here from the New York Times article oh, sure. about this disruption, which actually quoted your tweet. Yeah, <laughs> which, which had a typo, which embarrasses me deeply. <laughs> well, you know, uh, that's uh, that's what happens when we live in the social age of social media. That's but, what happens when we decide we're going to tweet during, during a production. Show, yep. <laughs> Anyway, so the the New York Times report here is, uh, they write, a production of Julius Caesar in Central Park was disrupted on Friday evening by two protesters who objected to the bloody scene in which the title character, played by an actor costumed and styled to resemble President Trump, is knifed to death. A woman who later identified herself on social media as Laura Loomer jumped onto the stage just after the assassination of Caesar and began shouting, stop the normalization of political violence against the right, and this is violence against Donald Trump. Ms. Loomer describes herself as a right-wing investigative journalist and activist who has previously worked with James O'Keefe, the conservative activist known for selectively edited undercover video investigation. Uh, They go on to say the show was paused briefly with the actors still on stage as security officers removed the two protesters from the Delacorte Theater. This is the theater where it was performed. Uh, The audience tried to shout down the protesters and applauded as they were removed. Uh, The show then resumed as a stage manager announced, pick up at Liberty and Freedom, referring to the lines in the play that came next. Yeah, I mean, it it was very brief. I mean, the all praise to security and house staff and the actors and and the production staff for for making it go away so quickly um and the sheer fact that the right moment for it to come back i mean i have to say i if the crowd was was shouting people down i i don't remember that as clearly what I remember was when the stage manager said, let's take it back to liberty, freedom. The place just exploded with applause. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, whether you call it irony, whether you call it perfection of that moment in terms of the rights to free speech and for a play to be performed um, was, was spectacular. Uh, the play this this was not an act of violence this was a play um and there the the complaint that one heard from the stage was suggesting that that this was an act of violence and no it was an act of speech subsequently what was interesting for me is is i i did very quietly and carefully holding my my phone close to my belly, feeling this was somewhat newsworthy, and I have a decent amount of Twitter followers. I did send a couple of quick tweets about what had happened, and when I got out of the theater and was walking home, I saw, just just by tweeting, stuff had gotten around, Mm -hmm. and and some people who weren't happy with what I had to say uh, were already coming at me. The Twitter mob. and, um, And one of the statements was, we shut it down. And I made the statement, nothing was shut down, it was a brief pause, and the show went on as before, and the show still had its effect. Well, that really annoyed some people. Uh Um, But one of the many arguments that I heard from from the people who, who favored this political action was that this was their free speech. And the fact is, free speech does not mean you have the right to simply disrupt anything you want. If they had wanted to write, if they had wanted to stand outside the theater and hand out leaflets, if they, as some people did, wanted to stand outside the theater and and shout their opinions, um, that is their right. It is not their right to come into a performance that collectively people have agreed to attend, uh, whether it is paid or in this case not, and disrupt it. That's, That's not guaranteed under the freedom of speech. Yeah, Frederick Douglass has this great line in a in a speech that he gave uh, in Boston at one point where he says the f- the freedom of speech also means the freedom to listen. 
And in this case, you have an audience that, as you said, voluntarily chose to attend the performance. And uh, there were hecklers who chose to veto um, the, the rights of the audience to, to listen. And the thing that struck me about this, you have a conservative cohort going to a performance and trying to end it. And this is something that we see happening, coming from often the left, but sometimes the right on college campuses as well. And you see people like Tucker Carlson or other people in the conservative press condemn that, that act, that heckler's veto action. But when it's used to, you know, gore the other ox, they support it, I should say. So it, it seems as though there is a double standard here. And if we need, if we want to protect free speech for all, if we want to protect the free speech of conservatives to speak on college campuses, we also need to protect uh, the, the, the speech rights of liberals when they come to campus. And if they're controversial, people like Bill Maher often is, is protested when he comes to campus, but also in, in you know, off-campus settings like the Delacorte Theater, where they stage a production of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Yeah. When we start choosing who has the right to freedom of speech, then we get into a very dangerous area, regardless of what political persuasion is behind it. Yeah. I appreciate that people may not have liked this production of Julius Caesar, not simply in the way that you don't like a play, but because they don't like the production choices that were layered upon the text. Um, that's their right, and they can speak and write about it all they want. But there's not a right to stop things simply because you don't like what is being said. Yeah, and I think in this context, given that the argument among the, some of those in the conservative press was that this play was normalizing violence against political leaders or uh, advocating in, in the most extreme sense, the assassination of Donald Trump. It's important to keep the play Julius Caesar in context, which I think for most viewers who, who see the sh this, this play, by the end realize that the assassination of Julius Caesar was probably a bad thing. Oh, everything goes to hell. Yeah. I mean, it's not as if, I mean, these are, you know, these are all supposedly noble men in the Roman government who who decide that the only way to achieve what's right is through violence. And, of course, it, it, everybody's dead at the end. <laughs> Sorry, you know, it's a 400-year-old play. I, I should have shouted spoiler alert. But, you know, but, but there was no desire, and this is, is so often true, you know, especially in this era of shaming and, and people being quick to, to, on the draw on social media, there was no desire to understand the context of the show. It was people were simply reacting to what they saw. Uh, and because I think that initial Fox News report did have somebody had shot some video, which is not really legit in any theater, indoors, outdoors, free or not, um, only of that moment of the assassination of Caesar, um, that that caused everything to build up more. You have to remember, the show ran for two and a half weeks before anything, any kind of protest began. Is it possible that in those first two and a half weeks that 1,800 people a night had seen this show and absolutely no one had a problem with it? I'm sure there were some people who didn't like the depiction, but they said, I don't like the depiction. I don't like what they did. This they didn't art, feel the need to to stop it. Yeah, I watched it, and it. I thought it was what theater and art is supposed to be in many contexts. It's supposed to make us think. In many cases, it's transgressive, and and I enjoyed the you know the the placing of a story from 400 years ago on top of um, you know contemporary stories that we're telling ourselves about populism, because uh, it's a story about populism. Well, it's about populism. It's a 400-year-old story based on however many eons we have to go back to, you know, to the original Roman history. Um, that's about the futility of political violence. And so, but nobody, nobody 
uh, who, who opposed it wanted to engage with that. And that is, is so often the problem when we deal with opposition to whether it's books, whether it's performances, whether it's speeches, whatever the expression is, is that so often the opposition is responding to what they've heard about a thing rather than engaging first with the thing itself and formulating and coming from an informed place. Because without context, you can take a whole lot of things out of context in a whole lot of literature, movies, TV, plays, music, what have you, and make it sound terrible. It's only in the totality of the work that you can understand what the intention was. Yeah. I dealt with um, a school production of the musical Ragtime that was initially going to be censored and altered by the school administration to remove any offensive language. And Ragtime is a story of, uh, a fictional story about the black experience, the immigrant experience, and the, the white experience at the turn of the century and how society was moving towards multiculturalism not easily. And the play, uh, uh, the musical, as did the book which preceded it by Yale Doctorow, does use the N-word uh, in, in the course of the musical. It's used 11 times. And the reason the school was going to edit it was people had heard that that word was used and they wanted it removed. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, it's a show about the ugliness of racism. And as the authors have said, you can't pussyfoot around the ugliness of what was said in order to understand dramatically how people respond to it. it it's not a show which glamorizes that word in any way, shape, or form and absolutely shows it to be hateful. But if all you hear is high school students are going to say the N-word on stage 11 times, you've completely lost the thread of, of what the intent is and what, what overall the show means to do, which is to show in part why words like that are so damaging and so wrong. Yeah, and that's something, so I, I'm seeing two threads here. We're dealing with a lot of concerns over theater productions because they've become political or they're arguably political. The Julius Caesar is one. We saw it with Hamilton too, when uh, Mike Pence attended Hamilton. And then we've also seen a lot of productions that have become controversial because of their use of racial epithets, often in the context of putting the audience in an environment uh, where those words were often used, as with, with ragtime, in a historical environment, I should say. Your first involvement in trying to fight theater censorship also uh, dealt with the use of the N-word as well. Yeah, it was uh, back in 2011 in Waterbury, Connecticut, where an arts magnet high school was, plan was in rehearsals for a production of August Wilson's Joe Turner's Come and Gone. Um, and this is a school with a majority uh, population of students of color. Certainly August Wilson is one of the great playwrights that America has produced and, and certainly probably the most significant uh, playwright of color to date. Uh, and the school superintendent, who was black, um, heard that the N-word was utilized in, um, in Joe Turner and um, said, can't do the show. I won't allow that word to be spoken on stage. And it's widely known that the Wilson estate will not allow his texts to be changed, as is their right and as is appropriate. And it was, it was sort of stunning because here's a major work by, by a major playwright of color, which incidentally had been premiered and developed in Connecticut um, it was certainly not unfamiliar work. And to deny students the opportunity 
to to do that work or to attempt to sanitize that work just didn't make a lot of sense to me. That was actually the first time I said anything. And in fact, the first time I, I, I wrote about this on, on uh, the blog of the American Theatre Wing, where I was the executive director at the time, and, and I was moved to do so primarily because I was from Connecticut. I grew up near Waterbury. I what, had previously been the executive director of the O'Neill Theatre Center, where August's work early works were developed. I'd seen the premiere of Joe Turner at the AO Repertory Theater. I just sort of felt I could say something to this. And I should say, and I knew August, Mm -hmm. who who passed away more than a decade ago, um, I felt I could say something. And it might matter um, at that point. And to be perfectly honest, I thought it was a one-off. I, you know, it, it did after a few weeks and with enormous support. I don't want to in any way pretend that, that my voice was, was either the sole voice or the deciding voice. There was enormous support from Yale Rep and the Yale School of Drama and indeed you know, really passionate statements from the students involved in the production about why this was important to them. But the decision was reversed. There were some educational programs put in place, contextual programs, uh, so that no one would go into the show unaware of what they might be seeing, what they might be hearing, and why those words needed to be there. But the show did go on, and I actually thought that, you know, I for me it was just, okay, well, that was this week's blog post. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, you know, I was, I was very happy with the outcome. But in the wake of it, it, it prompted more people to start contacting me when they heard about issues. So that's, that's how I, I started down this path. Uh, six and a half years ago. Yeah, and now you are with the Arts Integrity Initiative. You run the Arts Integrity Initiative. And what's what's the purpose of, of that organization? And we're, I should say to our listeners, we're in the new school right now, uh, which, which houses the initiative. Well, the initiative is essentially a professionalization of the work that I was doing. You used the word organization. It is mm-hmm. not an organization. It is primarily my work. Um, but given a home uh, very generously here at the New School for Drama, um, in part, as I said, to professionalize the work, to to give it some resources, and, um, you know, to really, through the school, show that there's an effort on the part of the drama program here to do more than just teach people to perform, but to think about what we perform how it's performed, why we perform it, and indeed in some cases to fight for the right to perform it. The work of the Arts Integrity Initiative isn't solely anti-censorship. Uh, there's a, also work surrounding uh, copyright and the rights of authors to protect their works and uh, ethical practice in the arts, but it sprang initially from this work that that I was doing um, around originally just high school theater censorship, which branched into um, uh, higher education and even professional level um, censorship uh, attempts, or in some cases, uh, when it's actually taken place. Yeah. How do you think art censorship has changed over the years. I thought with the waning of the moral majority, the grow, growing secularization of society, and the now easy access to transgressive art that we have on the internet and elsewhere, attempts at art censorship and, and theater censorship were going the way of the dodo. No longer do we seem to have the uh, the Rudy Giuliani's of the world who protest the Brooklyn Museum putting on a Chris Ophelia, um exhibit where, you know, the the crucifix is surrounded by cow dung or whatever that that piece of art was. Well, you you've mixed up two works. You, you know, but but um regardless no. well, what were the two works that I well, well well actually I was thinking of Andre Serrano yeah, which Piss dealt Christ. with Piss Christ which uh, which which was a crucifix um in in urine and Chris Ophelia's piece though I think it was a the holy it was a holy mother of, it was a, yes. Yeah. So I think I have it here in my notes. Um, but, but again... Nico here with a quick editor's note. The name of Chris Ophelia's piece is The Holy Virgin Mary, and it featured a black Madonna and incorporated dried elephant dung. Um, I have to say, I think it's, it's... There is always a desire on the part of people to control the narrative. And if I were 
a historian rather than primarily a guy who's made his career working in theater. Um, I could probably tell you much more about history, but, you know, whether you you cited the moral majority and then you spoke about Rudy Giuliani and his opposition to the Brooklyn Museum in particular, we certainly had the opposition. The Andre Serrano piece was was um, was also, you know, part and parcel of the late 80s and early 90s attacks on the National Endowment for the Arts. But in a way, we can also go back to, not in a way, we really can easily go back to the McCarthy era, where so many artists were being scrutinized, not even for the art, but for their own thinking, uh, for their own decisions of who they associated with or what they thought might be... uh, a valuable way for the country to go politically. I'm not saying yay or nay to what any of those individuals, you know, did or didn't think, but the idea that there was such a drive to to control the narrative or the thinking behind the narrative that might have influenced the narrative. You know, these things happen over and over and over again. In the 1800s, you had a whole series of Shakespeare plays that were being altered and given given happy endings because <laughs> Shakespeare plays were were bleak and and people didn't want to see that. And yes, the language was pretty. So so I think this has gone on constantly uh, in in any number of societies because there is an understanding actually that creative expression has power. Therefore, controlling the means of creative expression is a means of asserting power. And you mentioned earlier about uh, the incident with the cast of Hamilton. Um, As has been pointed out, the show is the show. You can say whatever you want. But the the very respectful, very politely made statement, whether you agree or not that it should have been made by the cast after the curtain call, even the vice president said he appreciated what they had to say and was respectful of, of their thinking. For our listeners not familiar with what they had said, can you just briefly... Uh, Describe it. It, it. it was a very short statement just saying to the vice president-elect at that time, it was before the uh, inauguration, that he'd seen the show and that, that he hoped he took away the show's message of inclusion. Uh, I'm, I'm probably respect, doing tolerance, this very— Respect, yeah. Yeah, and, and respect. Something in that um, vein. But, but— you know, it was nothing pointed. It was not a call out, et cetera, et cetera. And and the vice president. But when the president elect not only says they were rude, but demands their apology, as John Weidman said to me uh, the other day in a conversation, he said, you know, when you've got the president elect telling people what they should do because of what they said, that's a really dangerous area when when artists are being told how to behave yeah the the president and donald trump in, in typical donald trump fashion tweeted out our wonderful future vp mike pence was harassed last night at the theater by the cast of hamilton cameras blazing this should not happen the theater must always be a safe and special place the cast of hamilton was very rude last night to a very good man mike pence apologize exclamation point yeah. i mean first of all uh, the, the the idea that um, the theater should be a safe space is is anathema to the idea of of a lot of awfully good theater because theater yes there's plenty of theater that wants nothing more than to make you smile and laugh and that's great but there's also plenty of theater that wants to make you think challenge your ideas perhaps persuade you uh, perhaps make you uncomfortable. So, so I think as as a theater critic, uh, I would I would not want to see our our current president hired as a theater critic, um, because it's a very narrow view of what not just theater but of what the arts can be. It shouldn't be safe. It should be a place that is safe to go into and hear 
ideas which may be contrary, which may be difficult, which may threaten your complacency, but you should feel physically safe, which if we take it back to Julius Caesar, somebody running on stage to a bunch of actors who's a complete stranger, nobody knew what that person was going Mm -hmm. to do. That's making theater unsafe. Yeah. You had just mentioned that when theater, or like any art, has a message that is transgressive or could be perceived to be transgressive in some way, those who are threatened by uh, that message try to seize the means or try to take control of the message. And Donald Trump Jr., after the incident at Julius Caesar, like his father, had had tweeted out, uh, I wonder how much of this art is funded by taxpayers. And he put art in quotation marks there. Serious question. When does art, again in quotation marks, become political speech? And does that change things? Art's been political speech since the days of the Greeks. So, so I, I, you know, I, I don't recall where, where he was educated. But, but clearly he, he didn't get a grounding in the basics of, of drama history. Um, you know, I want to come back to something you were saying earlier, and you're talking about the opposition, you know, it can so often be, um, you know, either about politics or about race. I think there's an area we've not talked about yet, especially as it applies to schools, which is um, issues of sexuality. Hmm. Um, yeah. And I'm not talking um, depictions of sex. I'm talking about simply, uh, in some cases, something as simple as love. In other cases, um, it may portray expressions of physical affection. And when, especially when that is not the um, supposedly standard Male, female, uh, wasn't binary. Fun Home? I think that's the name of the. Well, Fun Home the, was a musical book, recently, but I'm even musical. I'm even thinking about you know in in high schools where the idea of rent, where there there are you know gay, there's a lesbian couple, there's a gay male couple, um, you know that 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 is something that we should be afraid of, and that schools can't even put that on and let that story be told. Fun Home is only now starting to filter out, um, though what you're speaking of is Fun Home, the original graphic novel, which has been challenged at the university level, even as basic required reading. But, you know, I I think it's fair to say, you know, we we may be talking about very broad areas. Um, Censorship can arise from anywhere for any reason. Um, There's this new law that's come up in Florida where now anyone can register objections. Uh, Maybe you know more about this than I I do. I don't. Um, Supposedly anybody can raise objections um, to material that's included in the school curriculums, uh, even if they are not part of that community or have students in that school hmm. and that there's that, we'll that, every, into, yeah. that every system has to have a designated person to take those uh, uh, complaints almost in the same way that that now everybody every government office has to have a designated freedom of information officer um, it's the opening up of the idea that okay, we're going to make it easy for you to object, um, seems to be opening a door that's that's going to lead to more of this. And ultimately, uh, in the case of partic- public schools in particular, and whether that's public high schools, whether that's public universities, um, there is certainly a desire to be risk averse. And there are all kinds of complaints that come at any educational institution for any variety of reasons. Um, The willingness of administrations to fight for the school play, one book in a library, what have you, um, is, is... it's not, almost like it's it's not worth it. Well, you worry that that's where they come from. As I say, the risk aversion is it's easier to just say, 
ah, we'll do something else, ah, we won't have that book in the library. And that is, and we've avoided this in this conversation, I keep trying to get through conversations without using it, <laughs> that's the slippery slope. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you start doing it for one thing, well, what's next? What's the incursion? And it was fascinating. I, I loved... A couple of years ago, I was up at a high school in New Hampshire that had canceled a production of Sweeney Todd and then oh, why? opened it Violence? Up, violence. Yeah. Um, and had opened it up to uh, an open meeting for the community to come and talk about it because they were going, there had been an outcry when the decision was made to cancel it. And there was one man who got up and he said, you know what? If it was just up to me, I'm not so sure I do want to see the kids doing this, but it's not just my decision. And I support the teacher and I support the students who want to do this show, mostly because if they can stop this, what will they stop next? Yeah. Well, speaking of next, before we got on air here, I don't even know what to call it. Is it air? <laughs> on tape here. <laughs> we were talking about a production. Zeros uh, and ones, really. Yeah, zeros and ones going through the tubes. Um, Assassins. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Assassins is a musical that uh, was written in 1990 by Stephen Sondheim and John Weidman, who I mentioned earlier. Um which is an exploration of the psyches of the various men and women who attempted or succeeded uh, in assassinations against U.S. presidents. Um, and so it's John Wilkes Booth, and it's Squeaky Fromm, and it's Lee Harvey Oswald and others. And when it debuted in 1990 at Playwrights Horizons off-Broadway, there were certainly people who just couldn't conceive of the idea of a musical on this subject. And though it was critically well-received, it did not move to Broadway, as would be expected of a Stephen Sondheim musical uh, at that time. And part of the thinking was that because it was at the time of the first Gulf War and it made people reticent to put money into it, the prospects weren't good. Um, and so it was delayed. The Roundabout Theatre Company was then going to do it in 2001, and it would have come just after uh, the 9-11 attacks. And so that production was delayed at the request of, of the authors and the creative team. Um, and ultimately, it finally appeared on Broadway in 2004 in what was a critically acclaimed uh, production. Um, it's coming back uh, just this week at uh, City Center in their Encores series of concerts. I think it's going to have five or six performances altogether in another hall that seats something like 1,800 people, um, but coming in the wake of of what erupted over uh, the Julius Caesar, one can't help be concerned that people unwilling to look at the total experience of assassins, the complete context, you worry that, that somebody's going to say, oh my God, why are we doing a musical about presidential assassin, assassins right now? Is this a comment on Donald Trump? Well, no, it's not. The show has been done continuously. It hasn't had a major New York production since 2004. There was a one-night concert benefit performance which reunited the 2004 cast in 2011. The show was just done at the Repertory Theater in New Haven uh, in, in April, I believe, and it's been done all the time since that very first production. In fact, it was done for years at colleges before it ever got anywhere near Broadway. But but you do worry that now anything which can be extrapolated out to be thought of as a potential commentary on a president who has shown, uh, let's just say, disregard for the protections of the First Amendment and freedom of expression, um, 
it's it, it's 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 worrisome. I, I hope it goes off without a hitch. But I, I did have a chat with with John Weidman about this, and um, you know, he said he's not he's not concerned. He's he's not worried. But yes, it's always possible. But it's always been possible with with a work this um, pointed, even though the point of the work is to say. These are disenfranchised people who've been, frankly, driven pretty mad. Um, and again, that their violence or their attempts at violence come to nothing. They don't, they don't improve the world. They don't improve the lives of the people who, who take these actions. Yeah. You've seen a lot of theater. By way of closing, what are your favorite productions at the moment what are your actually what's your favorite production ever well I'll answer the second one I actually have a practice of I don't um offer my opinion of of current productions that um, makes sense because you work with so many well because frankly I've worked in the theater I work with a lot of artists and the fact is is everybody wants to tell you exactly what they think of shows and so so I, I just I don't go there. It's it's far from secret that my favorite musical of all time is in fact Sweeney Todd. Hmm. Um, uh, it's I just think it's a thrilling, amazing piece of work. Part of it stems from when I first saw it and how old I was and what it meant to me at that time. But it is by far the show I have seen the most. I go see any credible production of Sweeney Todd that I can. Um, but I'm pretty broad-based in my tastes. I see an awful lot of things. I, I, I would be hard-pressed to give you a top 10 list of my favorite shows because there's probably 100 and different shows for different reasons at different times. I have had the benefit of being able to see an enormous amount of theater in my career. Were I an actor, were I a director, I actually would have seen less by being an administrator my evenings are relatively freer <laughs> so i can i can get out there and see stuff um and there are things that i saw at one time that if i saw them now i'd probably cringe and there are other things that i may respond to because of what's in the air at the moment um so i mean my belief about theater my belief about the arts is there should be as much out there as possible for people to choose from and the fact is, yeah, there's work out there I don't like at all. And some of it's fairly successful. And that's great. It's part of the reason I don't offer my opinion also is just because I don't like something doesn't mean it's not valid. Just because there are sometimes things out there with messages that I find problematic, but I don't think they should be stopped. Um, so that's sort of the root of, of everything that I've always done, which is I just think I've made a career supporting the people who make art. I'm not an artist. I don't pretend to be. Um, and where I've shifted to over the past six plus years now is instead of just supporting and promoting and sharing, in some cases work needs to be defended and my voice is only one among many organizations uh, and individuals who do this work but I've been able to bring the skills that I've developed to bear to ensure that artists can have the voice they want to have and that's really fundamental to me and in, in the last years, you know, I've probably got 10 or 15 years of my working life le left. And if I can spend that time helping to strengthen and defend uh, and persuade people to support uh, work that others might challenge, then I think that's a pretty good thing to spend my time doing. That's a beautiful place to end. Howard Sherman, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. That was Howard Sherman, director of the Arts Integrity Initiative at the New School in New York City. To learn more about the Arts Integrity Initiative, visit artsintegrity.org. As for Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, 
If you haven't seen a production for yourself, I highly recommend it. If there isn't a production near you anytime soon, you can find the script for the entire play online for free, or you can buy a copy in book form. This podcast is hosted, recorded, and produced by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also email us feedback at so to speak at the fire.org or call in a question for a future show at 215-315-0100. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts. Reviews help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, beware the Ides of July. <laughs>